Ready. All right. Well, uh, good morning, everyone uh, listening online. This is Tom Katsuleas, president of UConn, uh, welcoming you to the um, All University Town Hall on Research. So, welcome uh, faculty, staff, and student researchers uh, and those uh, connected to the research enterprise. Uh, we appreciate uh, the patience that you've shown and the challenges. Uh, that you're facing in your research programs right now. And we hope to answer as many of the questions that you have uh, that we have answers for uh, through the course of this hour. And of course, there are some questions that no one has the answers for, but we'll do the best we can. And we're open to, to anything you might wanna ask. Uh, by way of introduction, I just wanna remind you of our high level philosophy with respect to uh, research and uh, and the big question of uh, when can we go back? Um, you know, our high level philosophy is number one, protecting the health and safety of our people and uh, supporting the state in its efforts uh, in public health and being good citizens in support of that, that effort. And uh, with regard to going back, uh, it's always been driven by uh, by number one is, is the health and safety question. And, and what we're looking for uh, is a signal that, that we can begin to think about going back. And the, the, signal, the signal we're looking for is, is twofold. One is a sign that we're on the backside of the disease curve. And uh, secondly, that we have uh, some, some signal of support from the governor about returning to work. And so those are the two things that are prerequisites before we can really go back into the labs. Um, but there is some encouragement this, this weekend that uh, there's some indication that the curve has peaked in uh, the New York, Connecticut, uh, New Jersey areas. And uh, so that first prerequisite may, may be here. Uh, when we look at the data at, uh, at UConn Health, uh, the, the graph is definitely at a peak, uh, and we maybe if you lean your shoulder to the right, it looks like it might be starting to to begin to come down. But it's it's right it's right at that point where it's a little um, give it another day or two, and we'll be able to see where we are. Um, but then the second piece is that signal um, from from our government leadership. Um, so when when we do go back, we will go back in a in a phased approach, similar. To a reverse of the phased approach we we did when we did a phased uh, uh, ramp down of research, and you're going to hear a little bit about how that process is going to go and what's planned for that uh, later today from Reden Redenka and Wes Byerly. Um, so uh, let's see. I, I think the other question to anticipate is um, you know questions about uh, grad students and. Um, you know, we, we, you know, our our big focus right now is uh, working with the federal government, uh, and our our representatives, uh, Chris Murphy, Rosa DeLauro, uh, Tom Cole from Oklahoma, who is also on the Appropriations Committee with Rosa, and encouraging them. And our number one priority in the, has been to um, to um, propose a twenty six billion dollar fund that would allow with cost extensions of all research grants that are all act that are currently active. And this is a, a national ask that VPRs across the country have gotten together and um, supported this as a, as a national effort. And because of our relationships with uh, uh, the key legislators, uh, it, you know, Rosa being the chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee being our representative from Connecticut, we're playing a lead role in that, and that's, that's the number one priority. Um, but with with regard to if that works or doesn't work, um, you know, our our priorities in terms of um, you know what we're trying to accomplish in in this period of of fiscal constraint is number one to prevent any long term harm to the institution, and number two to protect the current generation of students and really to ensure that they're able to complete their degrees. And so uh, the second, the sec whether or not we're able to get the, the federal funding or not, you know, our, our big concern will be to provide financial aid for hardship cases that uh, need it in order to complete degrees. And um, uh, there'll be more about that to um, in the rest of the 
uh, of this the town hall today, but but know that that's um, what our concern is, and we have the same concern for graduate students that we do for undergraduates in that in that regard, and that is absolutely um, focusing on ensuring that they're able to complete their degrees with as little delay as possible, and um, and really doing that through financial aid and making sure that financial aid is available for both the undergrads and grads. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to uh, Radenka Merrick and um, the rest of the VPR team. And um, I look forward to your questions and, and, uh, and their discussion. Radenka? Thank you, President Katsalas, and, and welcome everybody. And I first want to start by thanking our Yukon Health and Medical Community, all nurses and doctors and staff that work day and night to saving their lives. And this is our number one priority, saving the life and safety of our people. And we all acknowledge that COVID-19 has placed immense stress on our students, faculty, staff, and institutional finances. I also want to acknowledge the that we, we are grateful for the 75 million included in Coronavirus Aid Relief Economic Security Act for NSF rapid grants. And our faculty submitted five proposals. They had been successful. And I want to acknowledge both faculty and staff that work day and night from the moment of writing proposal until getting the funding in three weeks. I also want to acknowledge the faculty uh, between uh, that work on helping with ventilators and masks between the stores and Yukon Health and the Office of Management and Budget released uh, on April 9th that allows grant recipients the ability to donate medical equipment purchased with federal grants to entities serving the public. And many of you came together and donated masks and, and cleaning aids to Yukon Hospital. So that truly demonstrates the community and how in this hard time we come together as a community and one Yukon. So I want to introduce you Jessica McBride, who is in charge of our communication. And Jessica is going to read the questions that we received from Senate, as well as from many of you. And we are going to answer some of the questions that we received are related to tenure and sabbatical, and we will refer them to the appropriate offices to answer, but our office is not going to answer today. And uh, with that, you know, I will ask Jessica to start with the first question. So we received several questions about returning to work at the end of April, as previously announced by the university, and whether that date will be extended to May 20, consistent with Governor Lamont's executive order. One of the questions read, can it be expected that UConn and UConn Health will be following Governor Lamont's closure? for non-essential employees currently May 20th, or will the university be following campus internal guidelines for employees required to work? I will ask President Kassolev to answer this question. We, we are a state institution and uh, the governor is our leader. And so we expect to, to support whatever his guidance is. One of the questions from the University Senate was how will the OVPR keep the research community updated and informed about decisions related to research? OVPR will provide the regular updates as information becomes available using the usual communication channels and those are sending emails to deans, department heads and directors. We encourage everyone to check the OVPR website as any updates will be posted as well as information that are coming through our communication channel and are sent through emails. Thank you. We received many questions asking about when research will be able to resume and labs will be reopened, such as this one. Has there been any discussion about when research will be ramped up again? As the president um, has said, when research will be able to resume is going to depend on a number of factors, including the continued course of the pandemic, CDC guidance, when the state lifts or modifies the restriction on workplaces for non-essential businesses, and uh, when and how the university and the health center decide to resume on-site operations. So while it's not possible to provide an exacting date or timeline, 
uh, timetable at this point. Um, we are continuing to monitor all these and uh, looking for those hopeful signs. We also received many questions related to how research will be restarted and how the resumption of normal research activities will be accomplished. This one read, what's the university's plan to restart research in phases? If yes, what are the phases? The process to uh, ramp down research was a phased um, uh, process that looked to uh, address the guidance that the president had laid out in terms of maintaining safety and health of all our personnel, and at the same time, uh, keeping the university in a position to uh, bounce back and resume normal activities. So we had a uh, process to maintain and identify critical research infrastructure um, and a group of uh, folks that helped us look through that. We anticipate using a similar process um, as we move forward. So once the decisions made by the University of Yukon Health, it is you know, anticipated that we'll restart in a phased approach. Potentially, this uh, looks like bringing back equipment and facilities um, first, uh, followed by um, ramping up existing projects and followed by initiations of new projects. Exact timelines, again, difficult to establish, but the goal would be to accomplish a ramp over, over a period of weeks if this is possible, you know, not looking at this over as a long over months process. But of course, you know, the continued disease progress guidelines of the state and federal government are going to dictate a lot about um, how we uh, uh, continue to um, move forward with this. Uh, so we're going to hope that um, to use our uh, process that we employed to ramp down research uh, to ensure the safety and health of our uh, students, faculty, and staff in a reversing process to um, maintain uh, health and safety, as well as being able to move critical research infrastructure um, back forward to get the labs back open and get research progressing. I can uh, jump in and just ask if you can acknowledge the associate deans and team that work on the ramping down and the same team that is going to work on ramping up the research. Certainly. Um, we had five uh, folks representing both campuses that um, have worked uh, extensively on this uh, uh, across many days and into many nights. Uh, so Leslie Shore, who is in engineering, um, Raj Lalala, who is in the School of Dental Medicine, um, Kumar Ventakandarimena, uh, who's in College of uh, Agriculture, uh, Health and Natural Sciences, Lisa Parks Bush, who is CLAS, and Tony Vela from the School of Medicine. Um, all have uh, worked to um, uh, provide an orderly process to identify critical research infrastructure as we ramp down research and all have agreed to be part of the process to help us uh, restart research. Um, let, me, let me just add a, a little bit um, that uh, no, no one is more anxious to get everyone back to research than, than this group here from the VPR's office and those associate deans who are reading these. So, so as soon as we can do it safely, um, nobody wa and nobody wants you back in back in the labs more than I do. Um, so you know, in terms of the the phasing, uh, the, the the questions are um, the time sensitivity of the work and the the relative safety of the um, endeavor. Right. So that will make a big difference in the order. So if it's a single investigator working, you know, in isolation, there, there's less risk to the investigator and to public health. And so that is likely to go sooner than something that is more complicated and involves lots of people. And of course, there'll be lots of steps involved. And I think there'll probably be some more questions on this about uh, protective, protective steps as well. Okay, next question. Um, what guidance is there for REU programs, which are research experience for undergraduates and other summer research programs for undergraduates, the health research program? 
So, uh, given the uncertainties of the next few months in the summer, investigators are encouraged to explore telecommuting online options where possible. Because decisions about the summer are still being decided, the OVPR, in consultation with the Office of the Provost, advises that investigators should assume students will not be able to live on campus nor engage in on-campus research activities over the summer. Therefore, they should plan for other ways for undergraduates to be involved in summer research programs or consider canceling the programs for the summer. If it turns out that the dorms will be open, plans may be revised and participants notified accordingly. Changes to RUs must be made in coordination with the approval of the NSF program officer. Um, the NSF has a lot of guidance on this. We've got this on our FAQ site that you can, that you can get to. Um, I think they published about two pages of FAQs on RU type programs, um, as well as uh, they've stated to be very flexible and uh, making extensions of time. Okay. Um, this question reads, we have a survey based study and all associated work can be done remotely or online. What restrictions or limitations can we expect for this type of research? Researchers are encouraged um, where possible to um, move their projects to an online uh, uh, platform. So, you know, research that can be conducted remotely or without direct interaction with, with subjects um, can continue. We have a number of projects um, that are up and going. Um, if you need additional guidance on that, uh, please uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, we received many questions related to field work, both locally within the state or region and more broadly across the country and internationally. Most questions asked about when this field work could resume and when travel restrictions will be lifted. One question, which was typical of these, reads, our research involves one person outside in the field, i.e. in the forest or near a river, and is socially distant. Can this research be conducted? And if not, when do we expect this research to be safe to resume? Given the uncertainties of the next few months of the summer, again, we're encouraging where things can be done online or through telecommuting that that's the way to go. Uh, it's unlikely that we'll resume uh, field work um, until the university begins to resume research activities travel restrictions are going to need to be lifted by the university. Um, and the restrictions both in Connecticut and other states um, related to work from home and um, central businesses are also going to have to be um, lifted. So um, for much of our field research, it's not just the situation here in Connecticut, but for um, it's also going to be uh, related to the um, restrictions in the area outside of areas outside of Connecticut where field research is being done. Field research is going to be part of the ramp up process. Um, realize that it does uh, present some unique challenges, but also some unique opportunities, um, as is pointed out in the question about um, it being sort of naturally um, uh, distancing type of research. Um, you know, do remember if an investigator feels that not resuming field work is going to result in the loss of unrecoverable critical data if they can submit a request through the critical research infrastructure process the forms on the research COVID-19 page and we are certainly looking at those on a case-by-case -case basis okay um, researchers are obviously worried about the impact the shutdown will have on their grant budgets as compensation costs continue to be charged, but the expected work may not be getting done. There are many questions asking about funds to help research budgets negatively impacted. One of those questions read, how will UConn accommodate the financial burden of continuing compensation costs during this period of low or no work? Extending student and or postdoc contracts beyond the term of a currently active grant so that those researchers can perform the work required by that grant once the university reopens and covering other critical costs. It's great that we can continue to pay our staff from these grants during the shutdown, but that won't help if there is no money left to pay staff once they are again able to conduct the required lab research. To answer that question, as you are aware of the Office of Management and Budget released uh, uh, approval for 90 days of no cost extension on the grants and that started on the March 18th. 
In the letter submitted to congressional leaders on April 7th, American Public Land Grant University Association, along with several other educational association advocated for 26 billion in supplement appropriation for the federal research agencies in order to help sustain our scientific research work, workforce and labor. So on April 13, we submitted another letter and we requested congressional leaders to encourage agencies to ag adopt the greater uniform implementation of regulatory flexibilities and to provide supplemental funding to provide cost extension in support of additional salaries for staff, students, and people who are on the grants and to help with the ramp up. So we will keep you uh, posted as, as the things develop, but they have been uh, very intensive uh, lobbying from APLU as well as other institutions, including President uh, Kazulans talking to our representatives and our government office sending the letters to our representatives. Will internal funding opportunities such as the Research Excellence Program still be available for projects that can be conducted without face-to-face -face contact? For example, computer science research can be conducted with social distancing using software collaboration tools such as GitHub. So internal award continuing. Uh, we hope to make award announcements by mid-May with the caveat that start dates will be determined based on when the work can start. So projects that can start remotely will be funded immediately the start date for other projects that are not able to be done remotely will be determined based on when the work on campus can begin. For existing projects, similar grants, any work that can continue remotely should during Being locked out of the labs is increasingly becoming a problem for making progress on experiment-based projects. Is the university working internally or with funding agencies alongside other universities to loosen expectations or the legal requirements for research administration, such as effort reporting? I'll take this one. So you've heard some of the activities that uh, we're already pushing on from Radenka and from the president. We're working with government relations office, congressional delegation, other universities and associations to support efforts for more flexibility in grants administration. Um, regarding the impact of effort reports, I've been involved in a couple of uh, teleconferences with the Council of Government Relations, which is working on this issue with OMB. Um, at this point, there's no change um, under the federal guidance and university policy for grants to continue charging salaries under this unexpected and extraordinary circumstance. Therefore, the only thing that we're going to shift on right now with the effort reports um, is the certification language that researchers sign. Uh, there'll be an acknowledgement that effort during this period may include periods of little or no work, but payroll charges continue to be allowable under sponsor guidance. This is, this is still somewhat evolving, but this is the position that um, the majority of universities are taking. Um, because all of this is a quick uh, you know, it's changing, it seems like day to day, or the OMB will release something, and then there's a lag for sponsors to provide guidance if they're going to adopt it. For now, we're encouraging the PIs um, stay in touch with the program officer regarding any changes to work. Um, keep documentation of that correspondence in your local files. And if there's a change in scope, um, just remember the request has to come through sponsored program services and approved by the sponsor. Um, we'd also appreciate uh, hearing anything that you might be hearing from your program officers, just so that um, we're all uh, up to date on any information may be coming. Okay. Uh, I think at UConn, we have an opportunity to resume research by allowing one person per lab per day with masks. For us, it would make a huge difference if we could at least make progress with experiment, experiments that have been ongoing for months. So this is uh, an important question about how we continue and get back to research. Um, we're in regular communication with other research institutions that are members of the uh, American Public uh, Land Grant Universities, APLU. Um, and we are sensitive and understand the pressures 
uh, to allow researchers the access to the labs while ensuring uh, rigorous enforcement of mitigation directives. You know, directives such as scheduling act, potentially scheduling access, maintaining face covers, social distancing, things like no more than two researchers per bench or one researcher per thousand square feet, uh, potentially temperature checks, disinfecting work surfaces, et cetera, you know, things in this regard. So the health and safety remains our priority. And we're going to need to use this as a coordinated process um, to accomplish a transition back to research operations. It's going to continue, as we said before, to be informed by state and federal guidance um, and uh, responsiveness to the uh, public health mandates. Now, associated with that, though, is um, we are we're currently looking at using the critical research infrastructure process to um, explore having uh, a limited number of individuals with a limited time back into the labs to initiate and conduct work that's important to support um, up and coming uh, grant submissions. So we are in the, uh, in the early stages of being able to identify a process where um, it won't be reopening the labs, but identifying those uh, experiments and those um, activities that uh, are necessary to help uh, meet one of the president's mandates of not doing irreparable damage to the uh, research enterprise, but positioning us to be able to move forward. So more to come on this. How does the federal sponsor's OMB relief apply to my award? Is my grant automatically eligible for a no-cost extension? If so, how long is the no-cost extension granted for? Is my grant eligible for supplemental continuation funding? Um, so federal sponsors have adopted administrative relief granted from the Office of Management and Budget for grants. Um, this is a virtually across the board. Um, it did come in staggered, usually on these things the NIH and NSF begin, and then it, uh, the other sponsors will follow along in a couple of weeks. Uh, specific guidance by sponsors available on the OVPR COVID-19 website. In general, OMB provided for agencies to extend awards which were active as of March 31st, 2020, and scheduled to expire prior to December 31st, 2020, automatically at no cost for a period of up to 12 months. Supplements are not addressed in the OMB guidance, however. Sponsor guidance has so far stated that supplemental funds are not guaranteed. No cost extension requests are processed through SBS. Uh, okay. A lot of faculty are concerned about the HR language regarding GA appointments for the fall and the possibility of labs not reopening. If that were to happen, it would cause a disruption in our research enterprise that would be difficult to recover from. For some tenure track faculty, it could set them back significantly. Same thing with PhD students, most of whom are international. Um. As we said at the beginning, our top priorities is protecting this generation of the students from the fiscal impact of the current crisis and protecting uh, the Yukon family to extend possible. I talked about the letters that our government office, President Casillas and APLU members submitted and asking for the 26 billion in supplemental funding to help to support graduate students, postdocs, and other research personnel ramp down, ramp up costs and provide upkeep for the cold facility in research lab and disruption. The component that is in that letter is also not a cost extension for the federal from the federal agencies for the times that labs had been shut down due to the COVID-19 disruptions. So there is a lot of activity happened at the educational institution. We are part of APLU letter. President is working very hard as well as our government office. Okay, the Yukon health environment is unique since it is involved not only in education and research, but also direct patient care delivery. What is the plan to test investigators, students, and support staff in the research domain to allow individuals who test negative for COVID-19 or who have antibodies to return to work. 
perhaps on a schedule where some, but not everyone in a particular lab goes in every day while continuing to practice social distancing and wearing gloves and masks at all times to ensure everyone working at Yukon Health remains safe. Will the governor be making this decision with advice of his health advisors? The use of testing, so both disease testing and serological testing is you know, an area that is um, rapidly developing um, in response to the crisis. And uh, part of that development is how to use information from those tests in terms of uh, changing um, state and federal requirements around social distancing and getting people back to work. You know, the plan would be here to follow CDC, state, and UConn health guidelines on these requirements as we begin to develop a plan to um, move folks forward. Okay. Is the university willing to give summer support to students who will have a delay in their projects and won't be paid during the summer by their grants? So we know there's a lot of concern right now raised about summer employment for students, uh, graduate students in particular. Um, and uh, we are recommending that students um, uh, contact the Office of Financial Aid. There are going to be resources established uh, to include support for graduate students who are experiencing financial hardship. Uh, additional guidance is also going to be forthcoming from the graduate school as well as HR. Uh, but we recommend or highly encourage students to utilize the resources that we know are currently available and to do so through the Office of Financial Aid. Okay. GA summer salaries on grants. Is this allowed if research is still halted over the summer? If GAs cannot work remotely, can we still charge the grant? If no, who's paying the salary? I think for this question, we have Michelle again. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, we actually don't have specifics right now about summer salaries. Um, we are recommending the, the same guidance that we've been providing so far, which is whenever possible to telecommute uh, if you're able to. Um, and as soon as additional guidance comes from both the graduate school and HR, um, uh, we will be posting that on our website as well. PI summer. said that we should also check with the program director. So whoever manages your grant, please, please contact your program director and ask them for additional guidelines. And all of them are responding. So you will get direct instruction from them as well. PI summer salaries on grants. Do we need to reduce summer effort if labs are not open? Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, like we said, I guess for the GAs, whenever possible, telecommuting should be pursued. Um, and as Rodenka said, stay in touch with your program officer if you're making changes um, to your activities during the summer. Um, you know, do that. Do so in consultation with your program officer. Keep those uh, conversations documented you know, locally. And again, if that constitutes a change in scope, then the request must be formally submitted through SBS approved by the sponsor. Can research be continued as essential if delaying the work would cause significant delays on the order of a year or more in conducting or completing the work or delay or the delay would prevent the work from ever being conducted? We have certainly seen a number of projects where this is the case and are considering on a project by project basis. So it's part of the current critical research infrastructure um, review process. Uh, if you have a project that you think falls in this, submit um, a request through the uh, forum on the COVID-19 research page. PIs need to inform departments by June 1st if they are continuing GAs in the fall. What happens if research is still halted and PIs have made offers? So academic departments are being advised to, as long as they can, to delay making offers, GA offers for the fall, um, unless they are absolutely certain that they have the funds available to support those GA ships. And part of the reason for the, the delay in making the offers is that departments will be obligated to honor those commitments once those, uh, those offers are accepted. 
And so while we're trying to understand what the landscape is going to be like over the next couple of weeks, uh, to delay that process as much as possible. Um, again, for those students, I know that uncertainty is going to be very distressing and, and these delays are going to create additional anxiety. We do have at least some mechanisms at the university through the Office of Financial Aid. UConn has been awarded the CARES Act and part of that award was $10 million that must be dedicated specifically for student aid, student financial aid. And it's our understanding, at least in reading that act, that student aid would in fact include graduate students and we are uh, going under that assumption and our financial aid office will be managing those awards and will include graduate students who are experiencing financial hardship as well. So that's why we are strongly encouraging graduate students, uh, rather than waiting, to go directly to the Office of Financial Aid and use whatever available resources, including the Student First uh, Fund, as well as funds from the CARES Act, um, uh, for support. Um, we're going to shift to a couple of questions from Facebook. Um, so this one is, what is the best way to contact the IRB office? Faculty have many questions about the IRB process, consent process. Could IRB offices hold a virtual So the IRBs um, for both campuses continue to um, operate um, remotely, but um, pretty much on a normal schedule. Um, those folks are um, available um, through email um, if you need to reach out to them. And I know we're providing guidance around um, specific um, questions. Um, we certainly will look at um, potentially doing a office hours type thing around this. Um, but, you know, often the questions for uh, consent and those issues are very project specific. So it may be most efficient uh, to reach out by email and just set up a time to talk to those folks about your individual um, needs. Okay, um, here's another one from Facebook. Some research projects do not need any big instruments and can be done with small instruments in the PI's lab. Ramp up does not make sense for these, so can we assume such projects could start at the beginning of the research start cycle? Um, so it's you know difficult to sort of make absolute um, statements about what will kick off at the um, front end of the research cycle, you know, but we certainly are going to be looking to um, bring you know projects on as quickly as possible and uh, you know base that on um, the criteria around uh, you know, what needs to be done to get the equipment and the labs back ready to go. Um, so it's certainly possible that uh, uh, things that don't require large complex ramp up will be able to go uh, uh, quicker and earlier. Again, the idea for ramp up is not a ramping up over a period of months, ramping up over a period of, of weeks um, to get everybody back in the lab. Um. I'm going to do one more from Facebook right now, and then we'll shift back to the questions that we got via email. Um, if gloves continue to be limiting for the clinic and research, is there any concerted mechanism to overcome this dilemma? We donated 95% of our gloves to the clinic. Um, so I think in terms of use of gloves, um, you know, we'll be continued to be guided around um with the cdc and federal um uh, uh sort of requirements and guidance to use gloves um in that regard um we'd be looking at um the issue of where ppe is and um, how it's distributed as we begin to ramp up and begin to bring people back on the campus um, our, the focus will be um, on the clinical enterprise and making sure that we're able to um, to treat the patients that we have, um, and then we'll be looking broadly at how to um, make sure that we have the um, uh, supplies that are appropriate to meet the uh, uh, CDC guidance and CC, CDC requirements for individuals. Make a comment about the philosophy here is um, very similar in spirit to safety in normal times. In certain labs, you need to wear protective goggles, you need to wear lab coats, you need to wear closed shoes. Now, almost certainly everyone will have to have a mask. 
Uh, many will have to have have gloves. And the responsibility for the safety of the lab, it, it, it falls on the lab uh, personnel, the, the lab director. Now we know there are gonna be shortages and when when there are such things, then, then it will be our role in the administration to, to work with you and uh, work for on behalf of everyone to try to find uh, sources and supplies where, where, where shortages exist. But um, that philosophy, I think you can expect that to be just in general, the, the notion that uh, almost certainly everyone who comes back as, to campus at the beginning is going to have to be wearing a mask, probably faculty, staff, and students. And so um, somebody asked a question earlier about uh, shifts in labs where one person comes in one day and um, one person comes in the next. And the issue here is that, um, you know, talking to Seth Kalikman and in infectious diseases here, uh, just normal breathing produces a halo of about two feet where uh, an infected person's virus would, would fall on the desk and the, next, the person that came in the next day would be in principle infected by that. So um, it's not simple, uh, but the philosophy is, the philosophy is that um, lab protective gear will be the responsibility of each lab and in cases where there's shortages, we will work to try to um, collectively um, do the best we can for, the, for, for everyone. Okay, so we're shifting back to some of the pre-submitted um, questions. Apparently there are four teaching scenarios being considered for fall 20 relative to COVID-19 contingencies ranging from opening as usual to canceling the fall 20 semester. Would you please post these for all UConn members to consider? As much research staffing comes from students, what measures are being taken to coordinate those teaching plans with research? So I'll take this one. Um, this is a really an important question because so much of the decision making that takes place at the university is really gonna be contingent um, and hits multiple areas. And so that is one reason why the university established the executive policy group. The EPG uh, is part of the university's em uh, emergency management program. It consists of executive level leaders. It consists of divisional leads. And the primary purpose of the EPG is to provide coordinated decision making and recommendations to the president. So these exact issues are addressed by the EPG. There are uh, individual working groups that are established and so that decisions made in one area are not done in a vacuum and can adversely potentially affect other areas. So teaching decisions coordinated with uh, when we're thinking about research and ramping back up. So that process is already in place at the university. And I, I would like to also add that one of the reasons I know some of the frustration that occurs around when decisions are made or dates um, being issued, part of that delay is the need to have this kind of high level coordination. Um, and so the decisions where you may not hear them right away or not because there aren't individuals really working very hard to provide that kind of coordination. So the delays are really to make sure that we're not making decisions in one area that, that we may in fact then impact another. Um, so it takes us a little bit of time, but that time is because the coordination is so critical. Just um, current thinking, talking to um, colleagues and in infectious disease experts is that in terms of the scenarios that you mentioned in your question, which is everything from everybody comes back, all the students come back in the fall to uh, everybody's online for the entire fall, um, that range, uh, the call, you know, the, the essential items in place, most people think we will have the information we need to make that call in the sort of June to July timeframe, just so you get a, a sense. It'd be difficult to make that call without knowing about the availability of testing, contact tracing, where we are with respect to vaccines and therapies. So um, I think you can expect to get guidance in the next week or so about preparing for these various scenarios, but the actual decision on which scenario we're in, probably you can expect to hear in the June, July timeframe. I hope that's helpful. As the seventh floor of the University Tower at UConn Health is being discussed as a treatment site for correctional facilities, and there are currently research labs on the same floor, will greater security measures be established? Additionally, will there be additional biocontainment measures established if this space is used for COVID patients? The OVPR you know, continues to coordinate uh, with Dr. Aganobi and his staff on the clinical side uh, about um, 
the facility and making sure that there's appropriate security and biocontainment um, on both sides. And uh, we'll continue to be reaching out to him to make sure that uh, everything's in place. In the past, the OBPR listed year by year for each department, the total external funding. This was very useful information. Is there a plan to do this again? That's all the uh, OBPR um, quarterly reports of proposal award and expenditure data by department school and campus level of detail are still being produced and there will be an, um, a year end report that will contain the same information as it has in years past. Additional funding under the CARES Act, as I mentioned, 75 million for the National Science Foundation uh, through the rapid grant response, 954 million through the National Institute for Health to fund the center and institutes related to coronavirus, and 99.5 million to the Department of Energy Office of Science. And, you know, I want to all of our faculty to think about the new opportunities that emerged under this coronavirus act. So please look the funding agency, please see what is the new uh, and look how we can get extra funding. As part of ramping down research, many investigators significantly reduced their animal numbers. How will the IU Cook address the number of approved animals to address this? So the IACUC um, is aware of this issue and um, and others related to um, the animal uh, program, and they're going to be developing uh, guidance and get that out to address the animal counts and uh, uh, other components uh, that uh, were raised with both the ramp down and the ramp up process. Per university guidance full and part-time salaried employees paid on regular payrolls, including employees paid whole or part on sponsored projects, will continue to be paid until April 30th. What is the plan if the university remains closed into May? Will personnel continue to be paid on sponsored projects? Um, I'll, I'll jump in and then Michelle, you can add to it if, if you'd like. Um, so while university guidance has not yet been uh, provided, um, research will follow the university and UConn health decisions regarding pay policy when those decisions become available. The uh, general guidance out of the OMB um, relief that was administrative relief piece is that you follow your university policy. So once we know um, what's the plan for May, um, research will follow soon. We received several questions related to graduate students completing their degrees, such as losing critical dissertation research time. One question read, are there plans to allow time sensitive research to proceed on a limited basis for graduate students who need to graduate by the end of this summer because they are starting a new job in the fall? Similarly, will time to degree time be extended? So it's our understanding that the graduate school has provided uh, much more detailed guidance around these kinds of concerns, especially uh, delay in degrees, um, as well as other time sensitive uh, research um, that might impact uh, dissertation defenses and degree completion. And so we recommend uh, going to the graduate school website for that additional guidance and we have, uh, we will also post that on our website as well. Okay, I'm going to switch back to Facebook. Um, for a second, try and get to some of those. Uh, what about research staff? Are you coordinating with the NIH to continue funding to grant funded labs, even if the lab is shut down? Mike, can you follow up and uh regarding the NIH, uh, NIH guidelines when the lab is shut down and if the work can be continued to telecom or if it's completely shut down? Yeah, right, right now that sort of, fall, I think that comes back to the question we had uh, prior that goes beyond uh, the end of, of April in that it 
part of it will depend on university policy. The NIH did adopt the OMB uh, flexibilities, if, that, if that's the question that's being posed. So once the university makes its determination, determination, at least into May, we'll follow that guidance. Now, the OMB guidance was a 90-day initial um, flexibilities that then sponsors adopt. So we'll also be watching to see if that's extended. Okay. Um, we kind of already touched on this, but I think we should again. This question is about tenure. Um, a yes or no question. Does UConn plan to follow the leadership of several universities, such as Yale University, and add a year to the tenure track for workers on such tenure track? I will suggest president to answer this question. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the university has already taken that step. So, um, the, the provost to propose that to the board of trustees, it required, it requires board approval. And, um, at their last meeting, they received the, um, uh, proposal for, for this change. And then at the next meeting, they'll vote to presumably approve it because I, as I understand the board's supportive as well. So, yep, it's already in, in the works. Okay, I'm going to do one more Facebook for now, and then we'll switch back. Um, for the research startup phases, will there be different phasing for research that includes human subjects from campus and surrounding area versus purely lab or animal research? If so, do you anticipate a longer delay in research involving human subjects from the communities compared to other types of research? So I think, uh, let me take that one. Um, I don't know that there is good anticipated to be any um, particular differences between um, human subjects projects and lab based projects in terms of, uh, of ramp up. Uh, be looking at bringing both on back online um, and uh, in terms of uh, existing projects, um, probably getting out of the gate first, new projects then following, um, getting into community-based human subjects research um, uh, will be a lot like field research is going to be a little bit uh, more challenging. Some of that's going to depend on the ability to you know, be generally back out um, in the community. And uh, like with much community-based research is also going to be dependent on continuing to build and strengthen those community ties to where people feel comfortable with researchers being back in those arenas. Uh, but you know we don't really anticipate any differences between uh, uh, fundamental differences between the lab based and the um, uh, human subjects based research ramp up. Okay, um, back to some of the pre submitted questions. What is planned in terms of allowing subjects involved in clinical research studies to enter Yukon Health and the Clinical Research Center for study visits and blood draws? So again, I think, uh, let me take that one. Um, the, you know, we're gonna continue to be guided by the health center policy around uh, having individuals coming in and out of the health center. And so I think uh, researchers would, should anticipate um, that we're gonna you know, follow those um, guidances and, uh, and that process. Rapid and frequent testing for COVID-19 will be key to safely restarting research and other operations. Many labs at UConn on both campuses are capable in principle of performing tests using RT-PCR. If kits are not available, labs could order the necessary primers. The tests would not be sanctioned by CDC, but the governor could take executive action to enable testing. Our IRBs are capable of expedited review of protocols for validation. Is this being considered? And if not, why not? You know, testing remains a uh, complex um, issue. Uh, the FDA has a current um, emergency use authorization process that addresses um, both diagnostic and serological testing and the requirements necessary for those to move forward. So we would want to um, look to use uh, those types of processes. 
Um, we also, um, I think, would want to look to making sure that we're maximizing our uh, current approved clinical processes. So we can you know, be looking at all options and we'll certainly um, be interested in hearing from uh, investigators who are looking to try to stand up an approved process um, moving forward. Um, and I'm sure that we also will continue to, you know, take this and other um, ideas for advancing, you know, using our research base to help the state um, forward to the governor and his task force. Okay. Ordering materials and supplies is something graduate research assistants and staff can work on remotely and safely and pick up at Central Warehouse or later. Why was ordering sometimes weeks of lead time and get ready when labs open up? Um, so the ordering um, uh, was rolled back um, because as orders come in, uh, we have to have a process then to move them off of the order, you know, off of the docks and have ways for people to be um, present to be able to pick those up and uh, get those into labs um, and, uh, and get them stored. So part of uh, ensuring that we were able to have the minimal number of uh, folks on campus um, and you know, really support the social distancing, um, the decision was made to pull back on ordering uh, supplies uh, until we were ready to move forward um, with uh, ramping back up uh, the research process. So as we begin to do that, um, ramp up uh, part of beginning to reopen uh, the ordering supply chain uh, is going to be part of that and um, look forward, look to hear more about that, I think, in the upcoming weeks. Um, shifting to a Facebook question, no cost extensions don't put grant money back in a scientist's pocket, hoping that the federal government will provide additional money to grants is simply that, hoping. Will the university provide funds to help compensate for lost postdoc and staff time? Julie, would you like to answer that question? I wish I had an answer. Um, you know, we are all hoping federal funding uh, is available. Uh, there are gonna be a lot of unexpected costs with the pandemic and its aftermath, and as we look to re-engage research, um, you know, this is resources across all levels of the university, and we simply don't have an answer uh, to that question right now, but PIs should use the resources that they have available, including their IDC and DCAA accounts, um, if, you know, if we get to that point. But we are looking uh, for federal funds first, and that continues to be our, you know, what we're working toward. That's not certain at this point. Um, yes. Billion, but we don't know are we going to get. And uh, as information becomes available, we are going to send information and, and share with you. But uh, for now, we are very persistent. One letter went to congressional delegation on April 7th and the second one on April 13th. Okay, um, IDC salary savings accounts, will these accounts be absorbed or taxed by the university? No. So you have that for me, but um, to Julie's answer from before, I think uh, investigators should should be thinking as a last resort, um, if, if their grants, if their grant funding runs out, uh, to be using those those IDC accounts to help grad students be able to finish their degrees. I mean, that's number one priority. And we ask their support in doing that. But no, the university will not be taking those. Um, regarding the hiring and spending freezes, can you confirm that the hiring and spending freezes will not apply to external grant funded projects? So I can answer that one. It's, um... That has been our past practice. We don't anticipate that will be any different now. Um, and we know that the uh, provost office has already indicated that for grant uh, 
positions that are 100% grant funded, um, uh, there should be no issues with those being approved. But the, the approval process should be the same as with any employee. The expectation is that if these are 100% grant funded positions, um, they, will, uh, they will be exempted from the freeze. Um, okay, another one about graduate students. Um, my friends who are graduate researchers have recently been distressed by their advisor's apathy to the situation that we are all in right now. Not only have we had our daily schedules upended, but some of us have friends and family who are directly affected by this pandemic. And at such a time, advisors have not only refused to hear requests for time off, but also have upped the pressure to produce more research than usual. When my friends complained of being under undue pressure to juggle classes and research, under trying circumstances, their advisors demanded that they work harder. These friends are on fellowship, do not have GA ships paid for by agencies requiring deliverables or performing COVID-related work. Will the OVPR be talking to professors about being empathetic and understanding to the plight of their supervisees and advisees at this tough time? I think we are going to talk to provost and deans, and I'm sure president had already this conversation, you know, with, with students and deans, but this is we want to demonstrate the empathy and support for our graduate students. Okay, so um, I'm just, we're going to get towards our last question, I think, at this time. Um, unless, unless there's others that we need to address, but it seems like there's a little bit of confusion about the PPE question that we discussed before. Um, so I'm going to try a different one and we'll see uh, if this is answering the question. My understanding of the question on PPE was that for those who have donated their PPE supplies to the clinic and given current restrictions on placing new PPE orders for non essential work, how will PIs be able to obtain the PPE required for ramping up? This is one of the requests uh, to Congress for the for the research ramp up, and it's part of 26 billion. And in this one, we are asking for for the people that donated equipment to have the separate category that is going to help up with the ramp up and provide them with equipment or respiratory or cleaning uh, chemicals that they donated to hospitals. I think that we've we've run through all of um, I think all of our questions. So just uh, Jesse, let me finish and then I will pass to President. But I want also that we acknowledge that graduate students and postdocs are likely to face the difficult job market, which many public institutions already announced mandatory uh, hiring freeze. So we need to ensure that we continue to cultivate our STEM talent pipeline through federally funded graduate. So we are going as a community and members of APLU and, and urge the committee to look for innovative partnerships, perhaps with industry and other mechanisms to extend graduate fellowships, traineeships and postdoc opportunities across the federal agency so that our students can weather this difficult economic time. President Casalas, I would like you to say the last remarks. The before last the word. Okay. Well, um, I just like to thank everyone in the audience. I think we had over 500 people uh, logged in and watching. And thank you for the questions and and thank you for your patience with this process. And um, we know the challenges that you're going through. Uh, you are absolutely critical to our to our core mission, and uh, we're going to do all we can to to support your getting back into the labs and getting your research reactivated. Um, there are a couple of questions that we were able to answer for you today. And there were a couple of questions that we, no one knows the answer to. And there were a couple of questions that I think we owe you a better answer to. So I think by the end of the week, um, check the, the daily posting. We're gonna have some uh, updates on a couple of questions, uh, particularly your questions on supply chain and, and um, 
uh, your ability to get get back to ordering, and then your questions about um, the extension of research staff past uh, the end of April. And um, we didn't give you very good answers to those, so we'll give you updates uh, in the the 4:30 daily blast and. Um, uh, by the end of the week on those on those questions and uh, but thank you those were great questions I'd like to thank our panelists did a great job uh, with with um, taking the fielding the questions and I want to thank them because they're the team that really uh, is critical to supporting our research activity at UConn so thanks to everyone and please stay well thank you stay safe stay safe